I quite like this question actually because it's one of those synoptic bits that you can actually prepare for. This is a synoptic link between gravitational fields and electrostatic fields. It's actually comparing their size in within the atom, but then there's other synoptic bits as well, bringing in circular motion and de Broglie wavelength. So you've got to know that equation sheet really, really well and know the clues that point you at different equations in those different equation sheets. Okay, a simple model of the hydrogen atom consists of an electron moving a circular path around a proton. I think mean, that's going to be a surprise to you. In this simple model, it's the electrostatic force rather than the gravitational force that's responsible for, for keeping the electron in a circular path. By means of calculations, justify this statement. We're doing a lot of that in these exams this year. So essentially what we're trying to do is show that the electrostatic force is much, much greater than the gravitational force. Okay, you'll need this bit of data. This is the radius of the atom. So, well, I hope that you're familiar with two equations that, um, or I should say two laws, which govern these two relationships from your, what you've studied about fields. The gravitational force, that is Newton's law of universal gravitation, and Coulomb's law, which is the Coulomb force, or uh, force due to electrostatic charges. Okay, so essentially we just need to calculate those two to show that one is much, much larger than the other. So I'll do the Coulomb's law force over here. Uh, and I'll do the electrostatic force over here. I, my mistake, sorry. And I'll do the gravitational force over here. Um, you can do this by ratios, and I'll just do that at the end. So, K is in our data sheet as the Coulomb law constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9. And Q1 and Q2, well, we're talking about a hydrogen atom, which is an electron and a proton. So the charges on those are both E. Um, one is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and one is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that's why, in this case, they is an attractive force, okay? Because there's going to be a negative, but we don't really need to actually worry about that in terms of just comparing the magnitudes, which is all I'm doing in this um, calculation. So over R squared, so 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 all squared. I'll calculate that in a moment. And then the gravitational force, we use the universal constant of gravitation, g, big g, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, and we're going to times by the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron. So they're both in my data sheet as well. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. and 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. Okay, and that is all over R squared as well. Okay, so put those numbers through the calculator. Minus 8.1 9 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons, something that seems about sensible. It's quite small because we're just talking about one proton and one electron. Well, yes, as you can see, this justifies this statement. My calculations show this, that actually the electrostatic force is much, much greater than the gravitational force. That's absolutely fine. We can actually show that as a ratio, okay, um, which would tell you how many times greater it was. So I'll just do the larger one over the smaller one, this being the larger one, this being the smaller one. Um, so I'll do minus 8.19 times 10 to the minus 8 over 3.61 times 10 to the minus 47. Gravity is always attractive, so we don't need to worry too much about why there's a minus or not a minus in this case. 
Electrostatic force over gravitational force is 2.27 times 10 to the 39. It's that many times larger than that. So this is why the gravitational force at this scale is absolutely insignificant. I'll just show you here how we can make that probably a little bit shorter and how we can actually go straight from this idea that we're trying to show a ratio between two things. Okay, well, what we can actually do now is we can put this, um, these two bits of data directly into an equation and we will see that we don't even need to worry about this number here. So if I put this one first, and then I, I'm going to do um, this over this, which is the same as saying this times one over this, so times r squared over g m m, then you can see, well, straight away, these cancel, so I can just work out the ratio k q 1 q 2 over g m m, which is You can see I get that same ratio that I had before, 2.27 times 10 to the minus, sorry, times 10 to the 39. Um, so that's actually much quicker, and that's, well, if that was an even harder question, they might not even give you that, and you'd have to work that out. This is a really important skill, actually, comparing ratios of things, and in A2 physics, or in A full A-level second year physics, they are going to want to ask you to um, show something as a ratio, or they're going to expect you to know that this is a good time to be talking about a ratio or know that a ratio is going to cancel something that you haven't been given. The last thing I'll just say is when I do this type of calculation, which is loads of numbers and loads of big powers of 10 and small powers of 10, the errors I make are, well, sometimes not typing the calculator, the calculator properly. So if you hit 1-1 one, one in quick succession, it sometimes doesn't register the second one. Um, also in copying down from the data sheet or even down from one part of the page to another I can often miss off the minus or just copy the power down wrong and I can put the powers wrong occasionally into the calculator and I can put the powers wrong when I just write down from the calculator screen so there's loads of places in a big calculation this where you can make a small error that's going to cost you a mark um, so when you go through do that idea of putting it all through the calculator have the skill of thinking is this a sensible kind of order of magnitude i was thinking here well that's tiny tiny what well, possibly way tiny than i was expecting but when we look at the maths we're thinking well actually this is all like times 10 to the minus 70 so i'm not surprised that actually this ends up times 10 to the minus 47. okay next one ignoring the gravitational force calculate the velocity of this electron in a simple model of a hydrogen atom well, I have no idea, but when we look back at the stem, because this is all part of A, and the information they're giving us in the stem is that it's a circular path. So I can use my circular mechanics here. So I've been told to ignore the gravitational force, so that's fine. So I'm just talking about this force here. So what I'm saying is the Coulomb force is equal to something to do with my circular motion. So I'm going to go to my circular motion equation sheet motion in a circle here. What's a force for anything moving in a circle? That's mv squared over r. So I can just copy that down. I want to work out v. I know r. So that is why they've had to give you this for this second part of the equation. I know r. I know m because it's an electron. Two one eight two eight three three or well, around that four meters per second. So um, I, whenever I calculate a speed of something like this, then I'm just going to check that it's actually not above the speed of light, and it isn't. So that's fine. Good idea just to express that in standard form as well at the end. In another model, it's assumed that the electron behaves like a wave with a de Broglie wavelength of lambda. So let's get our de Broglie wavelength ready. When we're told it's something to do with a standing wave whose wavelength is equal to the circumference of the circular path. And if we know the radius of the circular path, we know that the circumference is pi 
d or pi 2r. So that's um, 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11, I think it was. Just double check. Yeah. Times 2 times pi. Just do that quickly. Okay. Now that's the circumference of the circular path. And we're told that is the wavelength. So lambda equals this. Okay, so now we just need to know we've got a wavelength and we've been told that is a de Broglie wavelength. So we just need to find that equation there. Lambda is H over P. Okay, where H is a constant, P is MV. So we can sub that in now. P is MV, where we know we're talking about the mass of an electron and we want to work out V. So rearrange for that uh, lambda m over h equals 1 over v. So h over lambda m gives us v. Um, so put that in. Planck's constant. Planck's constant is the type of thing that you just remember once you've done enough practice. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Things like that can make you go that little bit quicker in the exam, which can be really useful. Um, but don't do it unless you're absolutely sure because we wouldn't want to make a mistake there. That's lambda. So m is the mass on an electron. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. Two one eight five five zero zero. Again, just checking that. Again, it's actually two point two times ten to the six meters per second. Okay, hope that makes sense. That's quite a nice question, really. Quite a lot of number skills there. Working with large numbers, small numbers, lots of standard form, lots going on the page. So be well organized. Make sure your maths is well organized and. The examiner can follow what you're doing. So if you do make an error, then at least you're going to get the marks for using this equation and sh and comparing it to this. So that's a really important skill in physics, being able to figure out ratios. Ratios help us to understand and simplify our maths. Okay, ratios are really, really, really important concepts when we get to A-level physics and beyond. You've got to be really resilient as well, being able to use a multitude of equations making one thing equal to another, rearranging and using your calculator skills really, really well. If you've got the time, make sure you check through, make sure you've got the skill of just those quick checks through the power of the tens that you've got a sensible answer.